Today on The Grave Talks, Emotions of the Dead, a conversation with Eileen Jones. Late one night, Eileen Jones woke up to the sight, sound, and feel of a strange man hovering over her in bed. When she realized it was not her husband, Eileen quickly learned that she was having a paranormal experience. This led her on a journey to better understand who and what was haunting her and her then-boyfriend's home. Beyond that location, she went on to investigate countless other locations, including the house in between and many others. We discuss her experiences today on The Grave Talks. Well, mine kind of first started when I was dating my now husband. And what happened was um, I was staying the night over his house and I woke up and there was a man standing over the bed just looking at me, who, of course, I thought was him. So I kind of tapped on the bed. I was like, well, maybe come back to bed. Well, when I tapped on the bed, I was tapping my now husband. And I looked back up and the man was gone and I could still, you know, I can't tell you like all the exact details anymore because it's been over 20 years, mm -hmm. but I can tell you about how tall he was, the color of his hair, things like that. Um, and I know it wasn't like an intruder because where he was standing, it was the corner of a wall. He would have had to go past me while I was looking at my husband to leave out of the house. Yeah. So that. Of course, I never said anything. I kept my mouth shut because I didn't want to be the crazy you know, fiance. <laughs> so, years later, I was talking to my husband and he proceeded to tell me, well, at this point, we're already married and all this. He's like, yeah, there used to be something in my house. I was like, oh, you're talking about the man. He's like, no, it's a woman. I said, no, baby, it's a man. And... um so I got to just kind of describe him to him. And he's like, you never told me about this. I said, well, of course I did. I mean, I'm not crazy. And um, someone, a friend of his was standing next to him and was like, you know, my parents built that house. I was like, really? And he showed, he told us about his father and it, the description was just like his father. Mm -hmm. And supposedly, according to my husband, it did not like women in the house. So I don't know why it didn't attack me or my husband's first wife. It just, the other pe women it attacked. And um, it, he said that his dad used to beat his mom. Mm -hmm. So it kind of made sense. Well, forgot about that years have passed. And well, didn't forget, but it yeah. <laughs> kind of went on, but moved to our first house back in Pearl. And my daughter, you know, my husband was in the hospital. I was seven, eight months pregnant, and I needed my daughter to help me with something. She passed by my room, and I thought, okay, I need her to come help me, so let me holler at her. Well, being a preteen, she ignored me. So I chased her through the house, and she just kind of disappeared. And she was, had my daughter has dark hair, and she had just got out of the shower, so it was longer than normal, but it was like really dark, long hair. She was wearing like a man's undershirt that was too long, so I thought she had her dad's on. And well, I go down to the game room, and she's sitting next to her brothers playing a video game, wearing a purple um, pajama set, and her hair was up in a in a towel. So never saw the little girl again, but I know I chased something through my house. Yeah. So I contacted a friend of mine that I had gone that I'd known since junior high, and we started doing quote unquote investigations, you know, not knowing what we're doing, just sure. trying anything at that point and kind of got into it that way. And then when my son had joined the Marines, um, I had met someone and he says, Hey, I'm going over to this place to investigate this house. Would you like to come? And I'm like, well, sure. I mean, a real legit investigation with equipment. Why not? Mm -hmm. So that's how I ended up getting into it. Wow. So prior to having that experience uh, with your now husband uh, at his house back then, what was your outlook on, on things ghostly and paranormal and things of that nature? I look at everything just because I don't see it doesn't 
mean it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Obviously, something started the idea of paranormal. So before I got into it, I never, I don't really doubt people mm -hmm. if it, unless it's like one person going, oh, I saw this. But most of the time, uh, I kind of look at, well, I've just not had the opportunity to see things. Mm -hmm. that could, and there was always something, you know, we all have that story of being in the dark when we're kids. And I think there's more to it sometimes than just worried about the monsters under your bed. Sure. I think we have people who follow us around. And when you're a kid, you know those things. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't something that was like, oh, that doesn't exist. It's not there. It's just something you really hadn't had really any experiences with it up to that point. Yeah, never really thought about it mm -hmm. one way or the other. Okay. Okay. So I mean, tell me about the experience in the house. And, and he said, correct me if I'm wrong, he was talking about having experiences there with a female uh, spirit. Yeah. Now, you've got to know my husband. He's kind of strange in a good way, <laughs> okay. but he's strange. He did marry me. Um, so he didn't have, he had an air condition, central heat and an air, but he very seldom was at the house. So he didn't have it all connected. It wasn't working. He's like, I'm never home. I really don't care. Mm -hmm. And he would go, man, it's hot outside. And all of a sudden the room would get cold mm -hmm. or he'll go, man, it's cold. And the room would get warm. It was like something was kind of taking care of him. Yeah. But he had, um, one of his girlfriends was in the shower and, you know, Something kind of attacked her in the shower. Um, of course, you know, he's talking about other girlfriends, so I really wasn't listening to the whole <laughs> the whole thing back then. Mm -hmm. um, but, I mean, he was just telling me about just different odd ends. Now, I don't know if anyone else that stayed with him, because being a bachelor, he had a lot of roommates, ever had much experience. But um, he knows, like, when he was around and his, he had a dog, um, she didn't like to you know, be alone all the time. She would bark at stuff and things like that. But he just thought it was a female because to him, it felt more like it was keeping, you know, taking care of him mm -hmm. more so than trying to harm him. But it just didn't like women. Sure. Did he ever have any experience there that would correlate it to possibly being his dad more than what you've already explained to me about kind of his dad's personality and such? Well, it wasn't his dad. It was a friend of his, his dad okay, that sorry. actually yeah. built the house. Okay. But no. And if he's a type, he does believe in paranormal, but he's more into UFO cryptics, all that. So he's just never paid any attention to paranormal. So even if he mm -hmm. would have saw something, he would just kind of thrown it off. Okay. What what was, you know, at, at hindsight, you know, being 2020 and all these these years later, what do you think it was? Who do you think it was? Do you, do you have any idea who it may have been in that house? Um, after talking to the gentleman whose dad built it, I really do feel it was his dad. Mm -hmm. um, I have the house has kind of been is in a bad part of town. So it's essentially been abandoned. Mm -hmm. um, and I have wanted to get back into it. But it, again, it's not a good part of town for me to kind of go there by myself and sure. he doesn't want to go but um it you know I, I you know i really think that's probably who it is i really think it's the gentleman's dad that built the house my gut tells me that the description the height um all that kind of tells me that but am i 100 percent certain no so when you and your friend decided okay we're gonna start, you know, at that point in time, investigating, you know, in air quotes, because, you know, you're just beginning. You're, it's like kind of like, well, let's see what happens. And, you know, nobody really knows what they're doing. Um, what, you know, what was your goal? Were you trying, were you trying to identify what was going on? Were you trying to validate the experiences? What was, what was the goal there for yourself? I really don't know if we had a goal at that time. I think it was more I'm not crazy, and she believed as well. So mm -hmm. she kind of wanted to be like, okay, I'm not crazy either. Even though we both believed, you know, I knew what I had seen. And I had, at that point, had never heard of anyone actually seeing anything. But kind of, you know, as far as like full body. Yeah. And, you know, hearing things and all. And I wanted to prove to other people who, d I wanted to capture something to prove to others mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. I saw. And also it kind of, you know, I never kind of thought about it till years later. 
my mother had passed away in 2000 and I think it was more so I was hoping in the long run to figure out how to do it to see if I could find her okay it was kind of you know and I know the chances of that were very slim but it was just kind of like you know the underlying cause that I never opened up and saw Mm -hmm. what was your friend what was her reaction as you were you know kind of diving into all of this you know she believed you but what was did did she have any experiences prior to these things going on I don't remember. Um, She kind of stopped doing it with me. We only did it together for about two years, possibly two or three. Um, She kind of, you know, had a lot of family she had to take care of. So we weren't able to do it as much. So we really never talked about it on her end. Mm -hmm. And if we did, um, I really don't remember. I'm such a horrible friend. (laughs) But we still talk to this day if that counts for anything. (laughs) Sure, sure. So you 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 kind of did a little bit of this. You were, you know, you kind of came and went with it. How did that, you know, journey with, you know, paranormal experiences continue for you? Did you did you dive into the idea of investigating or did you have more personal experiences prior to to going into that? I didn't have any more personal experiences um, for a while. Um, and but of course, watching the television shows going, gosh, I wish I could go out and do this again, but really do it. And of course, you know, most of it, I was, I was raising my fourth child who was an infant at the time. And so I was never really able to get out. And then of course the kids started getting older and you know, what happens when the kids get older, we actually get a life again. And so when it was reached out to me to be able to go investigate, I was like, oh, my gosh, here's my opportunity I've been looking for. And I really appreciated that. So that's when I went to the house in Florence. Um, That's where we call it the Mississippi house. Um, Everyone else knows it from um, the documentary, The House in Between. So we went there and did some invest. I went and helped with some investigations there and did that location for approximately about five years, give or take. Mm -hmm. And then, um, of course, did a little bit of other places outside of that, but that was really my first location with um, documented evidence, with equipment, with, you know, other investigators who had been doing it, you know, for a little while. So that kind of actually is what got me to where I am at this point. Let's talk about the Mississippi House, or otherwise known as the House in Between. And for people who don't know its story, can you share kind of its backstory and kind of what's made people pay attention to it? Yeah, um, Miss Alice um, built the house in the 90s. Um, it So it's not an older home. Um, she did, she still to this day owns it she refuses to live in the house um, or stay there by herself because she has gone to bed and has seen lights in her bedroom which has you know woken her up and made it where she couldn't sleep um she has shut and locked doors which will open still with you know with the lock there um Part of the evidence that you'll see in the documentary, and I don't want to go too much into it for the people who haven't actually seen it, but um, you'll have a ball sitting on the stairs. There was one, There's the house has internal surveillance cameras and um, the ball was sitting there. You know, no one's at the house. So the AC, the heat's not on. The, um, the stairs have a little lip on them, which when you, if you watch it, um, If you watch it, you'll see it kind of go over the lip and the ball falls down the stairs after two weeks of no one being in the home. And so that kind of made us go, huh, what's going on here? Um, I remember when they, when it first started happening, everybody's like, oh my gosh. And that's one thing that's really good about the house there. There is an investigator that seems to be able to almost like, like teach the spirits in the house how to do things like coaches them hey you know once they start doing something hey can you keep doing this 
it's kind of a weird situation, but it works for that house and it works for that investigator. And um, so we're all sitting there like one day it was just myself and another investigator and he was in the kitchen eating and I was in the um, living room and no one else, like I said, was in the house. No one was around the stairs. And all of a sudden you start hearing boom, boom, boom. And I look up and the ball's just coming down the steps. No one had touched anything. Mm -hmm. And um, you'll have doors open and closed by themselves. Uh, Chandeliers will shut off um, by itself uh, several times. So you have a lot of different experiences in that house. Um, But nothing in the house seems like harmful. But like I said, if if I was staying in a house by myself, even just my husband being asleep and having a man stand over me, that's kind of creepy. Sure. So I couldn't sure. imagine trying to be in there by myself, even though if something's good or bad, you still can't see it. And it's still got a little creepy feeling to it. Well, with the house not really being all that old in terms of when you think of a haunted house, most of the time we're not going, oh, yeah, it was built in the 90s. Um, you know, it, it's what uh, what is the, the story or what is the thought process on who or what may be, you know, affecting the house or haunting the house? There um, there is still an ongoing investigation. The house has been investigated for about 10 10 or more years um, total, and it's still ongoing. Um, Doing research, the town has burned so many, uh, well, what, two or three times. So a lot of the paperwork burned with the town. So it's kind of hard to do a little bit of research there. But um, I do think it's more the land than it is, you know, of course, more than it is the house. The land, uh, there are a little bit more in the area that there's a cemetery within a half a mile to a mile down the road. Um, and with it, it was kind of up until, what about 20, 30 years ago, it was kind of like the town you just drove through. So it's not really been built up a lot Mm -hmm. but now it's getting a lot more businesses around there it's getting a lot more neighborhoods and things like that so i do think it's a lot more the land than it is the house because there's so much just history and that we haven't even been able to tap into all the history because of the records burning are there other houses nearby that that property, like neighboring houses, or is it off kind of by itself? It, they are nearby. It's not the neighborhood that if you if you watch the documentary, you'll kind of see the distance between some of the houses. Um, so it's on a main road, but but it's also like a main road for the country. But um, the it's, the house isn't sitting right up on it. I mean, you could put a nice add-on to both houses in between them. So there's a tree line that separates okay. pretty much both houses from her. So the the property area and all that and where the property lines are could have been very different years ago, depending on, on what they, they were. That, so my, my question I'm kind of leading up to is, uh, do you know of any other neighboring houses in the area that also seem to have unexplained experiences uh, going on at them? You know, maybe not necessarily all too publicized, but, you know, kind of whispered about. Yeah, there has been whisperings that there are some. A lot of people, because we are, you know, in the deep south, don't want to admit anything. <laughs> uh, so it's still kind of got its little frowned upon areas. But there has been whisperings of other houses that, and I don't know where they are located compared to this house. I don't know if it's like two houses down, next door, or straight over. I'm not asking for that specifically. Just wondering if in the general area. Yeah. So in the general area, yes, there is some others that have been secretly reported as haunted. And you were talking about the land locations and all I don't know if you've ever heard of these books called the Family Maps um, books, and they base them on counties. I don't believe so. You can go back into a book. I've got a whole section of them. Um, You can go back in the book, and that's kind of what I do is the 
research and history. Mm-hmm. And you can see who used to own land back in the 1800s and map it out to like, okay, so this street, this plot of land was owned by this person. And now keep in mind, everyone can draw just a tad tad wrong. Sure. So we did figure out that this, this plot of land was either owned by the Steen, it's like right on the border of being the Steen family which is kind of like the developers of that town originally Mm -hmm. or the Ross family, which is a very known family that's still in that area. So it's kind of like, that's kind of where I, where I kind of left off on the history of the house. Very interesting. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I just said very interesting. Is there, you said it doesn't, doesn't feel like there's anything harmful in the house or anything of that nature. What do you do? You think it's it's something that is is conscious that is there? Do you feel it's a more of a residual type energy that is is wandering around that house? Kind of a combination. Just just your opinion, having spent so much time there researching it. Well, I do think it's a combination in the house, but I don't. Again, I don't think it's because the house. Um, we have had, and unfortunately, and fortunately, I don't have any ability to see beyond our realm. Mm-hmm. But um, we have had three people in the house who did not know each other at three totally different times. Mm -hmm. They've said that there is a portal or like a train depot type situation in the house that different things just kind of come through. Mm -hmm. Now, you still have your residential spirits who stay there all the time and who do interact. And then I do think you have some that just come through. And then you might, and then I think you also have some that's, like I said, just part of the land that you, that are not intelligent. Mm -hmm. When it comes to, to hauntings and investigations that you've done, uh, obviously, you know, land is something that, that does seem to play a, a big part in it. How often do you think hauntings are, and this is just an opinion question, are more connected to the land uh, that that something is going on uh, at versus the the structure uh, that that one is experiencing in in current day uh, reporting activity on. Well, of course, all of it is speculation because yeah. you know. But in the I think a lot of it one kind of falls in line with the other one um, because I think a lot of times there is that when the land is haunted. I think sometimes it can make the house itself haunted, like this particular incidence. So where if there is a, like, you might have a plot of land, I don't know if this is making any sense, but you, the land's been here forever. Mm -hmm. And there's so much stuff, like I was at um, Broken Bow Asylum in Oklahoma and the Trail of Tears went through there. Mm -hmm. Well, did that cause more spirits to kind of, stick around from the asylum Mm -hmm. so it's like did one kind of lead to the other one being more because causing it to be more active sure of course it's all speculation i don't know and i'll know one day but hopefully not anytime soon (laughs) but so um the but so i think it's a little bit of both i think one can cause the other and then because Oh, I'm sorry. I've got tornado sirens, but we're they're far enough away. I'm sorry. Um, but if you have tornado sirens, should should you go to your place? I mean, I, I understand. I, I've worked in media for many years, and the first thing we say is go to your basement, your shelter, your inside room, where you know whatever you need to do. If we need to to stop this, we can stop it. Oh, I, I just learned recently our tornadoes um, sirens start talking, but this one's at least several. It's a little. It's probably another city away from me, so I'm still good. Okay, well, I'm in Mississippi. We go through these all the time. Okay, if if you need to uh, to step away, <laughs> just just let me know. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm a trooper here. <laughs> well, that'd be the opposite of what I'd be telling anyone to do when I was in radio. So um, we don't usually say go to your porch with your camera, although everyone does that. Um, so. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. So if I got a little distracted, I apologize. Okay. So did I answer the question? I I, I think so, and and I'm just I'm trying to get. Uh, 
uh, uh, you know, reconnected here as well. When I hear tornado sirens, I'm like, oh, oh, drop everything. Um, okay. Well, tell me, um, we're talking about land. We we're talking about, you know, spirits. Uh, and, you know, one comes before the other, chicken before the egg, whatever it may be. Um, places like that, like uh, like a Trail of Tears, we have uh, I, literally the Trail of Tears is a couple miles from where I'm sitting right now uh, here in Arkansas. Um, and it goes through a battlefield here and it goes, uh, you know, you can follow it quite literally and drive down it. Um, and it's, you know, it's an interesting place. Um, I, I, I don't consider myself that sensitive. I, I think I'm somewhat empathic, but I, I don't, uh, you know, you kind of just get vibes. Um, it's a very, you know, in some places it's serene and it's peaceful. In some places it's kind of odd and off, but I don't want to say menacing, but, you know, you just kind of feel a, a bit of sadness there. Locations like that, that, that kind of have that going on where it's, it is into the land and it, it's not just a structure. Are, do you think places like that, it, it's almost forever tainted with sadness, with an energy that I don't want to say negative because I'm not trying to connotate anything evil, but, you know, people go through traumatic things. It's, it's a negative experience. Um, and, and something like that is, you know, a place that I would consider to have that sort of a feel to it. Areas of that nature... Are they ever going to not have that to it? Is it almost like, you know, someone spilled oil or something that's very hard to get out of and it's just kind of everywhere and you dig deep enough into it, you're still going to find remnants of it no matter what? I believe so. I believe that there's, that that's always going to be there. And in a way, I mean, I, I haven't, I've been told several times I am empathic as well, but I have not allowed myself to open up yet because I have not been completely in an environment where I feel comfortable doing it Mm -hmm. um, other than like one time but yeah you know I I got what you're saying when you go there it's just like that you just kind of get overwhelmed with the emotion I think that's just without even having any abilities sometimes because like you said it's such a negative experience but I do think that it's there regardless of what anybody tries to do. I mean, it's so, it was such a strong emotion. Mm-hmm. Tell me about uh, some experiences that you've had uh, while investigating that that you did, in fact, run across emotions, feelings, entities uh, that, that were not the friendliest. They weren't just kind of hanging out in the house and doing what they have always done. But you kind of got an unwelcome sense or more there. Um, as far as like dealing with it, with anything that I just and I don't like to use the word evil either. Sure. I like to use you know because they're just mean people sometimes. Mm-hmm. But um, I don't, I've been fortunate enough. I really have not ran into that as much as people would think. Sure. Um, I've ran into more sadness, happiness, things like that, which I'm again very fortunate of. Um, the only time that, and I don't think it was again, I don't know about bad or anything. I mean, I was at Old Park Hotel in Ballinger, Texas, and you just walked into this one room, and I am so sorry, I do not remember what room, but you walk into this one room and you are just like hit with so much emotion. You're like even off balance. Um, and then, I mean, as soon as I walked in, I was feeling all that, and I was, they do believe that there was a murder in that room. Um, and then at the end of the, the hallway downstairs, um, my paranormal partner, um, Bud Steed, he did not want me to go to the end of the hallway. He says, something's down there. It really doesn't want you down there. And it doesn't like women. So he kind of wouldn't let me go down there at that point. We had been down there a little bit earlier, but at that point, he's like, no, you really don't need to go. So I've kind of always had, um, between him and David Childers, some of the people I've investigated with, they really kind of, and I hate to use the word watch over me because we're all there to do the same thing, but we all kind of look out for each other. And if someone senses that you don't need to be somewhere, they just don't let you go. And I am the stupid one that will run to it. So they're trying to teach me to think before I react. 
That wraps up the first part of our conversation with Eileen Jones. To hear part two, become a gravekeeper. That's a supporter of our program. We'll ask, what is the stronger emotion that leads to an imprint on a haunted property? Happiness or sadness? And do we ever miss a haunting when it feels to be positive? What does Eileen think caused a location like a funeral home to become haunted, considering most people spend very little time there while alive? And initially, Eileen got into investigating the paranormal with a desire to communicate with her deceased mother. Has she ever been able to have that experience? Until next time, for The Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.